Now, today, because we are celebrating the ordinances of the Lord's Supper and of baptism, I want us to spend some time preparing our hearts by addressing the subject of remembrance. I wanna talk to you today about the subject and the topic of remembrance. And uh, to do that, we're actually gonna go back to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter one. Now you're like, man, I thought we were about to be in chapter two. Why are we going back to chapter one? Well, a couple of reasons. One, like I said, because I wanna talk to you about remembrance, but two, because the passage that we were supposed to look at today is not a very family-friendly passage. And uh, their, their kids can't be here for that next week. So we're gonna go ahead and just have that be next sermon, next week's sermon, and uh, we'll do the more fam family-friendly text today. So in light of that, we are going to be looking at Ecclesiastes chapter one, verses 10 through 11. Ecclesiastes chapter one, verses 10 through 11. So go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Again, Ecclesiastes is after the book of Proverbs. And we are looking at Ecclesiastes 1, 10 through 11. And if you are able, I would love for you to please stand for the reading of God's word. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Solomon writes, is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. Everyone say new. new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance, everyone say remembrance, of later things yet to be among those who come after. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, as we come before you this morning, we are grateful for the opportunity to remember. Lord, uh, we are just so prone to forget that every day, every Sunday, we need to be reminded again. And so God, we are grateful for the book of Ecclesiastes. I am incredibly grateful for all the different conversations that I've been able to have with people who have been directly impacted by this, by this book and by the passages that we have covered. God, I thank you that both your word and your work are sufficient. And so this morning, as we gather here, I pray that it would be a reminder and that everything that we have talked about before would come back to remembrance. Because the reality, Lord, is that even though under the sun there is nothing new, in the sun, S-O-N, everything is made new. And so I pray that it would be you, Jesus, that it would be Christ and him crucified, not man and him glorified, but Christ and him crucified that is preached from this pulpit. So in light of that, I pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be honoring and glorifying to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We love you, we thank you, and we pray all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. So in Ecclesiastes chapter one, specifically verses 10 and 11, we are going to be looking at this concept, this subject of remembrance. And I would argue that in this passage, there are two lessons, two truths that we learn about this topic of remembrance. Now, the first truth, the first lesson that we will learn today is we will learn that we will learn about the many who forget. Everyone say many. The many who forget. What we see here in verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 1 is that Solomon is arguing that nothing, and by nothing he means nothing, is remembered under the sun. And for those of you who have been walking with us through this series, you know that that phrase, under the sun, it means apart from God. So apart from God, under the sun, if this world is all we have horizontally, then there is nothing remembered. That is what Solomon is arguing in this passage. So let me reread for you uh, 10 and 11. He says, is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. And then this is the verse that we're going to camp out, at, camp out on. It says, there's no remembrance of former things nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Now, the Hebrew word here for remembrance is the Hebrew word zikron. 
And essentially what it means, it means a memorial, a reminder. It means to commemorate something, or it can mean a place or symbol that reminds. Now, what I love about this word zikron, which not all word studies say, but as I was studying, I came across this, is that the word zikron implies that the way things are remembered specifically is through praise. So, the, so it's not only does it imply remembrance and to be reminded and to commemorate, but it, it also implies that the way that things are remembered is specifically through the act of praise. One generation praises God to the next generation. That's what that Hebrew word zikron implies. So what we see here is that Solomon is arguing that under the sun, apart from God, absolutely nothing is remembered. Absolutely nothing is zikron, which is the Hebrew word there. Now, what we see essentially in the rest of scripture is that most of the Christian life is one of remembrance, is one of reminding and recalling and rehearsing. As a matter of fact, uh, right now I'm reading this book on preaching called Preaching as Reminder. And the whole premise of the book is that true preaching at its heart, at its core, is just reminding. In other words, if I stand up, this is, this is a false teacher 101, okay, you ready? If you are listening to a preacher who says to you, man, I got something new for you today. I was studying this week and the Lord gave me a word for you. Listen, if the word that the Lord gave them is not in the word that he's already given us, turn that off. Because they're about to say nonsense. Okay? That, that is what we see. That, 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 that Christian, the Christian life, as a matter of fact, in the book, he quotes this Puritan who said that the life, the, 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 the work in the life of a preacher is to be a remembrancer. He makes up a word. We are to be remembrancers. That what all preaching is, is reminding you of what has already been said. And so if I ever get up and I'm like, I got something brand new for you guys. No one's ever said this. Then you should walk out. Because I'm about to give you worldly wisdom. Horizontal wisdom. There's nothing new under the sun. And even though everything is new in the sun, God has given us his word on purpose. That's why we have been given the word. The word of God is sufficient. The work of God is sufficient. And something that I try to talk to you about every chance I get is that I believe that in this city, in this region, in our country, there are plenty of people who believe that the word of God is inerrant, right? that the word of God is inspired. But unfortunately, there are not a lot of preachers in our country that believe that the word of God is sufficient. Because if the word of God is actually sufficient, then I don't need to spend the first 15 minutes of every sermon telling you a funny story to engage you, to hook you. This ain't comedy hour. The word and the work are sufficient. And you can say that to your blue in the face, but you prove it by how you handle it on a Sunday morning. And if the word and the work are not sufficient in the pulpit, they are not gonna be sufficient at the kitchen table. And they are not gonna be sufficient in the hospital room. And they're not gonna be sufficient at the, at the funeral parlor. They're just not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Why? Because only the word and the work are sufficient. We, we have to be reminded of that daily, daily. And so the Christian life in its very nature is one of remembrance. It is one of reminding. It is one of recalling and rehearsing. And here's the thing about God. And I'm so grateful for God for many reasons. But one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for God is because it says in Psalm 103 that God remembers, get this, that we are dust. I regularly forget that I am dust. Every morning I get up thinking I'm deity. God remembers, though, that I am dust, that I came from the dust, that I will one day return to the dust. And so because God remembers that we are dust, God commands us again and again to remember, to be reminded, because he knows that because we are of dust, we will forget. 
we will fall into gospel amnesia. And so what we see again and again in scripture is we see examples of scripture commanding us, God commanding us to remember. God commanding us to recall and to rehearse. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, Solomon writes, after all the things that he says in this book, he says, remember also your creator. The reason why he has to command us to remember our creator is because we only tend to remember the creation. I don't remember the vertical. I only remember the horizontal. That is where I am tempted to find my identity. That is where I am tempted to find my significance, my security, my satisfaction. And so the reason why he has to command us to do it is because we are prone to forget it. So that's what he tells us, to remember your creator. And I love this, especially on a family worship Sunday. He says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. We, for some reason, in the American church have fallen into this trap. And sometimes parents have reinforced it where we almost tell kids, hey, you know, your, your younger years are for you. Go figure yourself, yourself out. Go explore, go do you. And then when it's time to settle down, when you find a spouse and when you get a job and when you buy a house, you should probably go find a church. It's time to start taking God seriously. But what Solomon says is that we are to remember our creator in the days of your youth. And even though we live in a culture where adolescence has been expanded that now 31 is still adolescence in our culture youth here doesn't mean 31 just fyi before what before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say i have no pleasure in them and for all the older folks he's talking about getting old okay i'm sorry i i didn't write this but some of y'all woke up and you're feeling pains all over it. You felt no pleasure, you know, getting up this morning. But he's talking about remembering God before you get old is essentially what he's saying. Okay. But then this isn't the only place in the Old Testament where we see it. Look what it says in Exodus. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, God here is talking about the Passover meal. And he says, this day shall be for you a memorial day, same Hebrew word, zikron. This day shall be for you a zikron and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You see, God is a generational God, but, but our temptation, just because of how we are, we don't just idolize the things in front of us. We tend to idolize the generation that we're in, right? So one generation just assumes that they're better than the next. That the one, they're, they're better than the one that came before and they're better than the one that comes after. But God is a generational God because he's an eternal God. And he says, I want you to remember this day. I want you to keep it as a memorial from generation to generation. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. And then in Exodus 13, he says, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Now, he said there what the Lord did for me. Don't miss that. It's not what God did in general, but what God did for me in particular. We're going to see that theme come up again and again. And it says, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. Now, some of the Jews took this literally and tried to hang things from their forehead. But essentially what it's talking about here, this is that word zikron again. It says that you are to keep this, this remembrance, you are to keep this in your memory. Front and center is what it means there in the Hebrew. That the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. So again, we see God. He knows that we are dust. He knows we are prone to forget. He knows that we are all struggle with gospel amnesia. And so what he does is he says, remember, he commands us. These are imperatives. These aren't recommendations. These aren't suggestions. He's commanding us to remember. Look what it says in Joshua. Joshua 4 verse 5 says, And Joshua said to them, to the people of Israel, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. 
that this may be a sign among you when your children, again, again, generational, when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you, he says, right? Then you shall tell them what the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a zikron forever. But again, two times already we've seen it. What does it mean to you? What has God done for you? I think oftentimes we can fall into this trap as, as grandparents, as parents, as aunts and uncles, as people who serve in the kids ministry. We can fall into the trap of just talking about God in general. And God is awesome. And look at all these people that gather at our church to praise God. Well, what we see again and again in the Old Testament is that God wants you to share with them what he's done in your life. What what's God done for you? Right? Here's the other thing that I love about this passage in Joshua. And actually, someone mentioned it to me in the lobby. I had totally forgotten this. That when God tells the Israelites to put stones of remembrance at the bottom of the Jordan River, the, the Middle East is similar to here in some ways, but there is, equal to a, a worse degree, when, when there is flooding, the, the, the Jordan River could be as far as a mile wide. Right? But then during the dry season, when there was drought, it can be as small or as narrow as 100 yards. So, so get this, and I love this. The only time that the Israelites would see the stones was during the drought. The only time that they would see the memorial was when things were going bad was when they couldn't turn to the abundance of the land. It's when they had less that they were able to see that God was more. So the only way that the, the children would ever even know the memorial was there was during the drought. And in the dry season, when the water was low, that is when they were reminded that God was all they needed. You've heard this statement, right? You don't know that Jesus is all you need until he's all you have. When he's all that you have, you realize that he's all that you need. And I love that maybe you in this season, you're going through a dry season. You are going through a drought. Well, it's in those very seasons that we are to be reminding ourselves of the goodness of God, of the faithfulness of God, of the work of God. Amen? So that's what we see, that God again and again, he commands his people and what I love about it is that not only does this happen in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, look what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1. I love this. And again, this is such a good reminder for anyone in this room who teaches the Bible, for anyone in this room who's pouring into the next generation. And he says, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, he says, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. In other words, what Peter's saying is, he's like, I'm a broken record. You're going to come by me, and the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remind you again. Then he says, though you know them. How many of us? Well, that's how we treat the Christian life. Oh, well, I already read that book. I already heard that sermon. I already read that devotional. He says, I want to remind you not of brand new things, but of what you already know. Why? Because we are the many who forget. We are made of dust. We are prone to wander. And he says, and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Now, here's what I love about this. There are so many churches in this region who try to stir you up with emotions, with feelings, with heartfelt stories, with lights and with smoke. And, and, and a lot of people think, I haven't met with God unless I shed a tear, unless I get goosebumps at some point during the, 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 the sermon or the service. What he says is the thing that stirs you up is reminder. Is the reminder. It, that's it. Because every time I'm reminded, I have to be reminded because the implication is I forgot. And every time I am reminded, I have another opportunity to repent. To repent and believe again the same message. It, listen, it, if, if you 
are here today and you are visiting, we are so glad you are here. But if you think that I, this is going to be the church where every week I got a new word from the Lord for you, you might as well go somewhere else. Because every week we are going to go back to the word of God. Every week we're going to go back to the work of God because what stirs you up, not from the outside in, but from the inside up, is the reminder. The reminder of the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? He keeps going. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. So Peter's about to die. He knows his time is up. So what is he going to give himself over to? You can learn a lot about someone at the end of their life. What are they giving themselves over to in the last days and weeks and months, right? He says, in light of that, I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Anytime. See, for some of us, and this is true of me sometimes, we can only recall these things on Sunday morning. Man, it is so easy to recall and be reminded of the gospel when everyone around you believes the same exact thing you believe. Look, I am a huge fan of us singing corporately and praying corporately. But a lot of the Christian life is you and Jesus. It's just you and Jesus. And he's given us, he's given you the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, just to prove to you that the, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is remind us, Jesus says in John 14, I am giving you the advocate. I am leaving you with the Holy Spirit so that he might teach you something new. No, so that he might remind you of what I already taught you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And I love, and this is literally my prayer. In light of this passage, it really convicted me that my job, the, the elders and I, the reason why God has put us here in this time, in this season, in this generation, is to equip you and to remind you of the good news of the gospel so that you might be able to recall it at any time. The good times and the bad times. The mountaintops and the valleys. If the gospel that we are preaching is only sufficient for when things are good, it is not the gospel. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know this for a fact. I know, and this is part of the, the foolishness of preaching, I think, that, that there's no way that anyone can remember what I preached on July 4th, 2019. Every week I preach a message and most of it will be forgotten. But I want us to be a church that even if you forget every individual message, you know that at the end of each individual message, we point to the greater message. Now, I don't know every word this brother said because I'm pretty long-winded, but I know. I know he's long-winded, but I know that every week we go back to the story. Every week we go back to the only message that matters. Every week we don't end with do or with don't, we end with done. Because that is the only thing that you will be able to recall at any time. Only the gospel is sufficient for any time. That's why one of the things that we measure here at our church is gospel fluency. The, where the more gospel-centered you become, the more fluent you become. And there's nothing that encourages me more as the shepherd of this body than when I see people in the lobby or I hear people praying, I hear people counseling, and you can just hear the gospel starting to affect how they talk to God how they talk to themselves, how they talk to their kids. Gospel fluency, why? Because what we see is, is that when the gospel is truly preached and you equip people with that, they start to become fluent in it. And if it's only then that you will be able to recall the gospel at any time. But, but here's the thing, church. Because we are a part of the many who forget, the, 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 when, when Solomon says that nothing is remembered, he's not just talking about this life horizontally, the things that happen under the sun. He's talking about vertical things. We don't just forget uh, uh, the people around us and the people behind us, but we also forget the God above us. And, and here's the thing about forgetting God. It's a very subtle thing. It doesn't just happen overnight. But, but one thing then leads to the next thing, which leads to the next thing. See, oftentimes what, what, what it starts with, it, it starts with us forgetting the, the person of God, the person of God. And here's how we know. We said last week when we were talking about worldly wisdom, we, we looked at that quote from Dr. Jerry Bridges and he talked about the sin of ungodliness. And what do we say ungodliness is? 
Ungodliness is when you forget that God is God and that you are not. It's when you forget that you are dust and you start acting like deity, right? And in that quote, he talked about how ungodliness has permeated the church in the West and we don't think of God and we don't lean on God and we don't depend on God. And so the first thing that we are prone to forget is the person of God. Here's what happens when we forget his person. When we forget his person, the next thing we forget is we forget his proclamation. God has given us good news. He didn't give us good advice. He gave us good news. But when we forget his person, we end up forgetting his proclamation. Not only do we end up turning to false gods, we end up turning to false gospels. From his person to his proclamation, the next thing we forget then are his promises. Almost every promise in scripture is tied to the proclamation of the gospel. If I don't remember the proclamation, I'm not going to remember the promises. And so we go out into the world as orphans looking for affirmation, looking for significance, satisfaction, security, and any other place but Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we forget his person and his proclamation and his promises, then ultimately what we forget is we forget his purpose for us. We said a couple of weeks ago that the purpose of life is God. He says, in, uh, Solomon himself says at the end of Ecclesiastes, it's the benediction that we've read every single week. He talks about how the chief end of man, the duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. So it's subtle. It's we forget his person and we forget his proclamation. You can't remember the promises if you don't have the proclamation, which then ends with you settling for a lesser purpose. And so now you assume that your purpose is your career. You assume your purpose is your marriage. You assume your purpose is your health or your fitness or your finances. You turn to something else for purpose because we were created for purpose. But if you forget the first thing, it all goes downstream from there. And, and I'm not saying this as someone who has it figured out. I am saying this to you as the chief of sinners. Every single morning, I need to be reminded because I am prone to wander and I am prone to forget. So in light of that, church, not only does God command us individually to remember, but in light of that, what God also does is he commands one generation. Remember what the word zikron means? It doesn't just mean memorial. It doesn't just mean to commemorate, but it carries the idea of praising from one generation to the next. That, that God doesn't just command us to do it, to, to remember him at the individual level. He tells us to remind the next generation. We aren't just to remind ourselves. We are to remind each other. And in light of that, look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy 6, this is called the Shema. It's a theological truth claim about God in his nature. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You, again, here's the, it's individualizing. Not, not, not y'all, right? We're not, in, this, this, he, this, well, he wasn't Memphian. Not y'all, you, you, personal. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then he says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. When we talk about this passage and we talk about this generational discipleship, I don't know why we're so quick to focus on the next generation and we overlook what it says about this generation. I can't give my daughters something that I don't believe myself. Yeah. I can't. I can't serve someone else what I haven't been eating myself. I can only take people as far as I've gone. I can't remind someone of something that I don't remember myself, that it's on my heart. And remember what we said about that word heart. In Hebrew, the word heart is not just your feelings. It's not just your emotions. It's the entirety of your person. It's your whole inner being. That it shall be on your person, on your heart. Head, hard hands, comprehensive. The word of God shall be on my heart first. He keeps going. Then he says, you shall teach them. Now, the Hebrew word here for teach, it, it means to uh, sharpen something, to sharpen a knife or to sharpen an arrow. But here's what it implies. It implies something being pierced. You sharpen something in order to pierce someone with it. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Hebrew, in Hebrews that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And only it can pierce the heart. 
So what I mean by that is when we are teaching our kids, I can't tell you, confession time here, I can't tell you how many times I'm trying to pastor my daughters, disciple my daughters, and instead of giving them the gospel, I just give them my opinion. I just give them worldly advice. I give them advice on how to succeed in the world. But the only thing that will pierce, that's what the Hebrew word there means, is the word of God. It's the work of God. That, that my advice can modify their hands, but it cannot penetrate their hearts. Only the word can. Only the word can. That, that as I allow the word and, and the work of God to penetrate my heart, it first has to impact my heart. Then and only then will I then offer that to them. And I think, like I said, part of the reason why I don't offer it to them is because I don't offer it to myself. Every morning I turn to a ladder instead of a cross. And the gospel that I preach to myself is will and him glorified instead of Christ and him crucified. And so how am I going to give them something that I don't have myself? And so the reality is, is that we sharpen in order to penetrate. But the penetration, according to Hebrews 4, can only happen when the word and the work of God are preached. Can I get an amen? That's what we see. And we are to do it diligently. Because here's what happens. This word diligent is so important. We will, get guilt, we will feel guilty after a message like this and be like, all right, man, for the next week, I'm going to remind my kids of the word. You're right. Diligently persistently, never stopping, giving them the word, giving them the work. And sometimes, church, it is as easy as telling your kids what you read in the Bible that day. It isn't that deep all the time. But how often do I find myself, my, my one daughter deals with security. The other one deals with significance. It's, and, and it's funny because they, they, they mirror me and Lily. But how often am I trying to counsel them and instead of preaching to their root idol, Instead of telling them, hey, it doesn't matter what your friends think. What matters is what God thinks. I tell them, hey, mom and dad love you, though. So, hey, don't find your fear of man and your friends. Find it in us instead. And then he says, you see, not only is it what we preach and how we praise, but it's our practice because he says, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So, so what we see, then you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I want you to see here, then what that means is, is that there is no divide between the secular and the sacred. We talked about this. There's no secular and sacred, but the gospel is sufficient for all of my life. It's not just sufficient for the sacred in my life, but for all of my life for my marriage and for my anxieties and for my finances and for my career and for my health. It's sufficient for every single thing. And then look what he says in verse 20. Now, here's why I wanna go to verse 20. Because Deuteronomy 6, if you've ever heard a message on children or on the next generation and us pouring into them, you're gonna go to Deuteronomy 6. Any children's ministry conference worth their soul, worth their soul will always start with Deuteronomy 6. The problem is they only ever give you Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. They teach you the how, but they never actually give you the why. And so you end up leaving as a parent, a grandparent, or a children's ministry worker, and you're like, okay, it's up to me. I got to make these kids believe. So they give you the how without giving you the why. Because here is what it says in Deuteronomy 6, 20 about the why. It says, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt and the Lord, we didn't bring ourselves out. We didn't call an Uber. We didn't sneak out the back. No, no, no. The Lord brought us out. As a matter of fact, there's another place in the Old Testament where the Lord says, I brought you out of Egypt on eagle's wings. In other words, you did absolutely nothing. You didn't even take a step. I did all of it. I rescued you. I redeemed you. I restored you. I brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in. I love that. He brought us out so that he might bring us in. 
and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. Why do we bring up the how of Deuteronomy 6 without ever talking about the why? It's crazy. We go to, we go to, these, to, to, to the next generation and we teach them all the principles and all the precepts and all the practices and we never remind them that it's about a person. It's a person. We were so focused on transferring uh, uh, the content that we forget about the covenant. That it's an actual person. It's a person that we are telling them about. And here's what's interesting. In Exodus chapter 20, when the Ten Commandments are given, everyone always talks about how the only commandment with a promise is honor your father and mother. But that's not true. You know why? Because what we see when we look at the Ten Commandments is that the second commandment, which has to do with idolatry, he says, if you worship a graven image and serve it other, rather than me, I personally will visit. He's like, though I, the Lord, am a jealous God, and I will visit not just your generation, but to the third and fourth generation because of your idolatry, because of your iniquity. I will visit them. And the word there in Hebrew, visit, it carries the idea of something being repeated. So whatever your idols are in this generation, if they are not dealt with, that is the inheritance you're actually giving your kids. I don't care how much money you have in your bank account. The inheritance you're actually giving your kids is whatever you praise and you worship. Your idolatry in this generation becomes iniquity in the next. That's what God says, specifically about idolatry. It's the things that we worship that get passed down. It's the things that we praise that get passed down. It's the false gods and false gospels that we actually believe that get passed down. And, and, but what I love is that even in that passage, as heavy as that is, God says, but to the ones who remember me and who put me where I belong, I will visit them with love. Not to the third and fourth, but to a thousand generations. That even in that, God's love far outweighs God's wrath. God's intimacy far outweighs our iniquity. God's grace far outweighs our guilt. But what I need you to see is that every single one of us is passing something down. We're all praising something, and whatever's being praised is what's being passed down. So in light of the passages we just looked at, are, are, are the, the next generation, again, whether it's the, the kids you serve in kids' ministry or whether it's your, your, your niece or your nephew or whether it's your kids or your grandkids, the next generation should see our practice and should hear our praise. And when the practice and the praise are there and the gospel is preached, the, only the gospel can pierce their hearts. So they see our practice, they hear our praise, and they are pierced by our preaching. Whatever gospel you're preaching is the gospel they're believing. Let me share a couple of stories here to illustrate what I'm talking about. One more on the negative side, one more on the positive side, like literally from my, our lives, right? So we have two girls, Alicia, who's seven, about to be eight. I want to make sure she, she'll get mad at me if I don't say that. And then uh, uh, Leah, who's 10. Alicia the other day uh, was in a, not in a really good mental space and did not want to go to school. It was last Friday, and she was like, I'm not going, I'm not going. I'm like, no, I, you're going, right? <laughs> like, I don't know what else to say. And she's like, I want to get homeschooled. And I'm like, well, we'll talk about that next summer, but right now we're going to school, right? So I take her to school. She's complaining the whole way there. And then when I get back, Lily goes, you know what? I think I'm going to pick up Alicia early today because she's not really in the best, you know, emotional state. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm at home working, and uh, Lily goes and picks her up about an hour and a half early. And so she comes up to my office, and she's super excited. She's like, Bobby, you're not going to believe it. I'm here early. Did you realize that? And I'm like, oh, wow. I, didn't, I don't know why I looked at my wrist. I don't wear a watch. But I was like, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that, right? And she goes, yeah, I'm in class. And all of a sudden, the lady from the office, she, she comes up over the intercom, and she's like, can I please have Alicia Franco? go to the office and everyone's like oh and, she, and I'm like what'd you do she was like I was like oh too I didn't know what was going on right and then I'm like cool and so what happened she's like yeah so she picks me up and I get in the car and she's like mom why'd you pick me up and she said this is what Elisa said she's like yeah mom looked at me and she said 
that uh, she wanted to play karaoke. And that's why she picked me up. I'm like, karaoke? And she's like, yeah, that's what you said. I, at some point, I guess we're going to play karaoke. That's why, that's why she picked me up. So I go downstairs and I'm like, Lil, what? Are we going to a bar tonight? Like, what, 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 are, we, what are you talking about? Like, I've never done karaoke in my life. What are, we, what are we doing here, right? And she goes, karaoke? And I'm like, yeah, at least it said that when you picked her up, you picked her up because you were playing karaoke. She's like, I said we were playing hooky. <laughs> but she was convinced. Alicia was convinced that karaoke was coming up at some point that night. Because that's all she had heard. Karaoke, not hooky, right? So that just goes to show when we think we communicate with our kids, right? We thought we were saying one thing and she heard a completely different thing. Now, on the other side though, um, uh, over the summer, I had a chance to read this book called Almost Christian. It's a book written like 15 years ago. And it was about this survey, this national survey that was done of young adults and older teens that claimed to be Christians. And so in this survey, they sit down with all these believers from all across the nation, and they ask them basic questions about the gospel, basic questions about God. And they said that what they discovered in the survey was that these Christian kids were way more secular than anyone thought. And these parents are like, I can't believe they walked away. It's like, ah, I don't know if they ever knew what they were walking away from because their answers were so heretical. So me, in my curiosity, I was like, man, I wonder what my daughters would say to these questions, right? They go to Christian school. We read the Bible every night. We do family devotional. I'm like, man, they, they'd kill it. They're going to do great, you know, patting myself on the back. So I sit down with them, and I'm like, okay, guys, we're going into a judgment-free zone. Say whatever you want, and I won't get bothered, right? Like, so we're going to ask you just basic definitions for basic terms. And so I'm like, okay, let's start with the gospel. And so they gave me the gospel and it was a lot of things, but the gospel, it was not, right? Like it was very, very heretical. And then we move on and we're like, okay, well, let's talk about the Trinity. And, uh, and one, for one, this, I'm like, the spirit, who's the spirit? And, and my youngest goes, he's a dove, duh. <laughs> and I'm like, and that's it? She's like, that's it, he's a dove. <laughs> so in her mind, there's no difference between the Holy Spirit and a Prince video apparently, right? She's just a dove. That's all he does. But then I'm like, well, who's the father? And they both go, yeah, the father, pff, he's the lazy one. And I'm like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, the son had to come and die. The spirit lives inside of us and he just stays up in heaven doing nothing. So it was heretics are us at this lunch. And so for the last few weeks and months, we have been defining just basic terms, right? So we've been defining the gospel. We have defi been defining what a disciple is. We have been defining what sin is. And, and here's what's interesting. The, the first definition we started with was the definition of the gospel. The good news, it, the, the gospel is the good news concerning the finished work of the Trinity. So we've been working through that definition that it is good news, not good advice. It is finished, not unfinished. It is done by the Trinity, not by humanity. So we've been working through that definition and have been looking as a result at false gospels that are close but are not the actual genuine article. And so one of the things that we've been teaching our daughters is to chew and to spit, that not everything that we chew or consume needs to be digested. There are certain things that need to be spit out. So we'll stop a movie or a show halfway and be like, girls, is that something we chew, digest, or spit out? And then we'll talk about it, right? Well, probably about a month ago, as they were getting ready for school, Leah has a, a locker now at her school. And so Lily and her went out to get decorations for this locker. And uh, as they go out, Lily finds these stickers at the store and she hands them over to Leah. She's like, oh, these stickers are cool. And Leah looks at them and she goes, no, nah, I'm good. And Lily's like super confused. And she's like, mom, we got to spit all of that out. And Lily's like, what do you mean? She's like, well, let me show you what I mean. This one says, follow my heart. That's not the gospel. And she literally worked through each one of the stickers and showed how it was a false gospel being preached to her. And she's like, so we got to spit. That's not from God. So, so she only knew what the false counterfeit gospel was because she had been exposed to the real one. You see what I'm saying? Now, listen, I'm not sharing this with you to pat myself on the back. I'm, because I, I told you they were heretics like three minutes ago. <laughs> I, I, I'm sharing this with you to show you that what we praise, what we talk about, what we prioritize, what we counsel with 
is what gets passed down to the next generation. Amen? So we've seen the many who forget. And I want to conclude today by looking at the one who remembers. The one who remembers. Everyone say remembers. Even though every single person that's ever lived forgets, there is one who remembers. And that is the Lord himself. And according to scripture, there are three things that the Lord remembers on our behalf. There are three things that he remembers that we are prone to forget. The first thing he remembers is his children. The second thing he remembers is his covenant. And the third thing that he remembers is his Christ, his Christ. So let's work through all three. The first thing that God remembers is he remembers his children. And I want to reread to you Isaiah 49, because this is the passage that we looked at a couple weeks ago. But here's how it starts. I didn't read this part last time. But this is Zion talking. This is the people of God talking. But it says, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken. And what we're going to see here is that in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for forsaken is very similar and is a synonym to the Hebrew word for forgotten. Being forsaken and being forgotten in the Old Testament are very uh, uh, connected themes in the Old Testament. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My God has forgotten me. Let's keep going. It says, can a woman forget her nursing child that she would have no compassion on the son of her womb? So God is about to compare himself to a nursing mom, to a parent, right? And, and, and what, what's interesting is we just read in the previous session that Zion feels forgotten. Subjectively, Zion feels forsaken and they feel forgotten. But just because they are subjectively feeling those things, it doesn't mean that they are objectively true. Because God says... To those feelings, he gives facts, and he says, even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I, God speaking, have engraved you on the palm of my hands. I wonder what that's making reference to. Your walls are continually before me. So, so even though we might feel forgotten, right? That's what Zion's saying. God speaks to what Zion is saying at the subjective experiential level. And he says, I have not forgotten you. I have not forgotten you. Here's the thing. Not only does he remember his children, though, he also remembers his covenant. Here's the thing about a covenant. And I've been working through this a lot, looking at biblical theology over the past few months for this course I'm writing. But here's the thing about covenant. The person that needs to remember the covenant is not the receiver of the covenant, is the giver of the covenant. Is the one who initiated it that needs to remember it. And the reason why that's good news is because with every single covenant, God is the initiator, God is the giver, and we are the recipients. But, but here's what we see in Genesis chapter 8 about God remembering his covenant. This is the Noahic covenant. And, and the, so this is essentially when the, the waters have filled, right? Things, things are getting bad. This is all really bad right now. It's only Noah and his, and his crew that are alive. And it says, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. And then look what it says in the next chapter about this Noahic covenant. It said, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, the, the rainbow, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember. Who, who, who remembers? God. God. Because remember, it's from generation to generation, and we just learned that every generation forgets. So, so someone else has to remember, and the person who remembers the covenant is not your covenant. I will remember my covenant. That is between me and you and every living creature of all, the fl of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I, how many times God says I? 
I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all the flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. So what we see here is that God is the one who remembers the covenant. That even though we are prone to forget, praise him for remembering what we are prone to forget because the one that needs to remember the covenant is the giver of the covenant, not the receiver of the covenant. But here's what's so beautiful. And I think this connects the whole idea of him remembering his children and him remembering his covenant. Look what it says in Psalm 106. It says, for their sake, he remembered. So he doesn't remember for his sake. I don't know if you know this, but God doesn't need anything from you. He doesn't. So that whole, well, God created humanity because he was lonely. No, he wasn't. God doesn't need anything from you or from me. It says that he remembers us not for his sake, but for our sake. He remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. So not only does God remember his children, not only does God remember his covenant, but lastly, he remembers his Christ. His Christ. Now, I know that's a weird statement or a weird phrase, but let me explain it. A lot of people assume that Christ was just Jesus' last name, like his name was Jesus Christ, right? But Christ is not a name. Christ is a title. It, it, it means the anointed one. It means the chosen one. It refers to the Messiah. Listen, the only reason, church, why God remembers his children and the only reason why God remembers his covenant is because God remembers his Christ. He remembers his Messiah. He remembers the anointed one. That's why the first two can be true. Here's why that's important. Look what it says in Isaiah 45. In Isaiah 45, we see this idea of God not remembering. And this part just, it blows my mind. Because he says, I am he, God speaking, who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. So get this. He remembers us for our sake. He blots out our transgressions for his sake. Because if God hadn't done that, we would never be able to go back into his presence. We would be obliterated. And then he says, I will remember, I will not remember your sins. Now here's the thing, church. It is so easy to look at a passage like this and be like, wow, look how beautiful that is. God just he just forgot. It's like Jesus died and God got that men in black pen and just it went off and he just can't remember anything now. But that's not good news if it just means that God forgot. Here's the thing. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're not. I don't know. I forgive people, but 98% of the time, the reason why I forgive is because I forget whatever they did to me. It's not because I'm so forgiving, it's because I'm so forgetful. And so the next time I see him, I'm like, I don't even remember what you did. So I guess we're good. You would think that's how God is. But we've seen it again and again that God remembers everything. God sees everything. God knows everything. So get this. For us, forgetting is a passive thing. You don't know you're forgetting something. It's just happening. For God, forgetting is an active thing. That's an active verb for God. He's not just passively forgetting. He is actively forgiving. Okay, here's why this is important. The reason why this is important is because what we see, even in the New Testament, is that this idea of God uh, uh, intentionally and willingly forgetting, the reason why it can happen, church, is because when we place our faith in Christ, we go from being in Adam to being in Christ. And we talked about this a lot during the series in Galatians. The definition of justification, which is a really big word, but it's a legal term that means to be declared righteous. And we said that justification doesn't mean that God treats you like you never sinned, right? That's what people say about justification. It's just as if I never sinned. That's not what the Bible teaches. Justification is not that God treats you like you've never sinned. Justification means that God treats you like you always obeyed. Why? 
Because when you place your faith in Jesus, there's a transaction that happens. He takes your sinfulness. He gives you his righteousness. So now you are no longer in Adam. You are now in Christ. And so when God sees you, he doesn't just see you as someone who never sinned. He doesn't just not remember your sins. He sees you as someone who always obeyed, church. Because Christ's righteousness is now yours. I don't know if you got the email, but that's good news. That's beautiful. So, so in other words, again, this isn't just a passive forgetting. This is an active forgiving. In other words, when God says, I will remember your sins no more, he's not talking about amnesia. He's talking about atonement. Your sins were dealt with. Jesus took your sinfulness. He gave you his righteousness so that when I see you, I no longer see you. I see Jesus. That's why he remembers our sins no more. And here's what's crazy. What the Bible teaches in light of that, there literally might be someone, I don't know who this is for, but there literally might be someone right now who is telling me, man, I would love to believe what you're saying, but you have no idea what I've done. There is something that I've done that no one knows of, and I just can't be forgiven. There's no way that there is grace for that sin. Here's what the gospel teaches. If you are in Christ, that sin that you can't forget is the same sin that God refuses to remember. And if you say to me, well, that's great that God forgives me, I just can't forgive myself. Then what you're saying is, is that your verdict of you carries more weight than God's verdict of you. that your horizontal justification carries more weight than his vertical justification. If God refuses to remember it, then so should we. It says in 2 Timothy 4 that every person on planet earth will stand before God one day. And when you stand before God, God will either remember your sin or he will remember your savior. That's it. We won't get up there sharing resumes. Look how far I got up my ladder. No, no, no. He will either remember your sin because you're still in Adam or he will remember your savior because you are in Christ. So this morning, you might feel forgotten subjectively. But if you are in Christ, even though you might feel forgotten, you are remembered. This morning, you might feel overlooked. But if you are in Christ, you are seen. And in a world where everything is forgotten, each one of us must go, must go to the one who never forgets. Amen? Good morning, Mission Church Online. We are so glad that you have joined us today. And wasn't that amazing word today mm -hmm. from Pastor Will? It wasn't um, very short, though. It wasn't. <laughs> that was a really good a devotional. short devotional, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Lynn Brownlee II, and this is my lovely wife. Sarah Brownlee. I was like, you remember my name? <laughs> I remember it, of course. <laughs> and we have Stephen moderating in the corner over there. So give some uh, love to Stephen in the comment section. Um, let us know how we could be praying for you. Let us know um, anything that you need um, that you would have us seek the Lord for. Um, we also have a QR code. Um, should be right above my head somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think over here. Um, You're you always a little like, off, but it's up there. <laughs> any question, just, just take a picture of that as well. Um, but today we're going to dive straight into this Ecclesiastes, and we want uh, my lovely wife to read um, Ecclesiastes 1, verses 10 through 11, if you don't mind. Okay. Verse 10 says, Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. Verse 11, There is no remembrance of former things nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Amen. So let's start off with this question then. What is something new that God has taught you in the message today? Did it convict you? Did it comfort you? Did it confront you? Why did it do that? <laughs> so I think for me, the new thing came at the very end of the uh, message he gave us today where it talks about 
um, the Father choosing to forget our sins and remember our Savior. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that I've knew, learned new, um, just the whole concept actually in itself, probably within the past six months. We've talked about this. Lynn and I have talked about this um, personally, where at the end, whenever, hopefully, Lord willing, God says, well done, my good and faithful servant, yeah. um, when we're you know going, at, when we pass and have to answer before God, um, that he is choosing to see Christ that covers us and not ourselves. Yeah. Um, and I think that reaffirms the portion that Will said about, um, where is that? We think we are deity. God remembers that we are dust. Mm -hmm. um, from dust you came and from ashes or to ashes you return. Uh, I think that that is a reminder for me because I, I have to humble myself, but also realizing that in the humility, um, the perfection of Christ covers us. Yeah. And then also the Father is choosing to continuously um, forget the things that we commit against him, the sins that we commit. Um, because I think as humans, like, the world says to forgive and forget, but a lot of times we don't actively forget. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that we think about forgetting is that hopefully one day we won't remember that something took place or somebody said something. Mm -hmm. But if you're anything like me, uh, <laughs> I don't forget a lot. It's that I just choose not to bring it up, but it's still hanging out back there. Um, so the fact that we serve a God who chooses to actively forget those things, um, I'm just really thankful for that. So that would be my new thing for the day. Oh, um, I was like, mine, it definitely has to be comforting mm -hmm. um, because uh, we so often forget. And for me, that everybody needs to remember is comforting mm -hmm. because sometimes I feel like I'm by myself and I'm just like, I'm so stupid sometimes in my head. I'm like, I forgot again. I forgot again. How should I? I can't forget. Mm -hmm. But yet it's comforting to know not only are we allowed to remember, but we get to remember because uh, so many times we think like in this life, we just will just forget all of our sins. But it's it's a beauty in remembering that God has brought us th thus far and, and continues to bring us from our past and from our sins. And so I look at it now. It's comforting because of that. Mm -hmm. It's like, yo, I get to remember his goodness. I get to remember his kindness. I get to remember his mercies that I knew every morning. And not only that, but he also remembers me. And I think that blows my mind because I'm like, yeah. the God of the universe would somehow look upon this little old God in Memphis and say, hey, I remember you. Mm -hmm. And even though you used to be that, this is who you are now. Yeah. So that's definitely my thing. Yeah. So let's go on to the second question. What are the specific features of life under the sun apart from God um, that makes everything so hard to remember and so easy to forget? And can you give examples? <laughs> I can't give examples. We were talking about this earlier. Yes. Um, for us, uh, for sure, I'll say for me, um, a lot of times life gets in the way. Just, mm -hmm. just flat out life, whether it's finances, whether it's family, whether it's our jobs, it, it just gets in the way and so often – we take that as priority over God. And a lot of times when we take that as priority over, over God, we forget. We just don't focus in on, on God. We don't, we don't seem like we got time for God because like, I got I to gotta take the kids here. I, I ain't got kids, but I got to do, <laughs> do this with the dogs. I, I got to run. Yeah. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. But it's like we, we, we get so caught up in those things that God ends up being on the back burner. And it's like, Mm -hmm. Under the sun, we realized through this series that it's not the worldly things that, that are more important because those things are passing away, but it's above and it's in the sun that's more important. And that's what we need to place our hope and our faith in. Mm -hmm. But as for you. Yeah, I think um, for me, I just have to remind myself constantly throughout the day um, because uh, give examples. It, it Like you said, it's multiple things throughout the day as soon as you wake up it's always something that we're constantly thinking about because um i think for me it's so easy to just get lost in what i can see around me mm -hmm. um and with lynn i've shared in the past week this shane and shane song my portion i've had to play probably five times honestly on the way to work and the song has to be about four minutes and my commute is probably round about 25 so it's the full commute i'm just hitting repeat repeat um because in that song i think in the chorus which i'm not a musical person so if that's not right sorry um it says my heart my flesh may fail but you are my portion and it's because i have to remind myself that christ is enough christ is sufficient 
I need nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. And the fact that I even get to partake of that and, you know, commit to believing in that and living my life for Christ and for the glory of God, um, that is enough for me, no matter what, you know, expenses come up, um, what life throws at me, what sicknesses or anything like that. Um, I have to remember that, that Christ is enough and Christ is more than enough. Yeah. Amen. Um, amen. Yeah. Uh, that's a good one. It, it's the bridge, but we, we're not going to shoot you today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See, he does the music. I do not. So there um, you are. But our next question, what we're going to do, um, in Deuteronomy 6, it says, God's people are commanded to pass down both the word and the work of God to the next generation. Mm -hmm. But what does that practically look like? And in what specific ways does one generation entrust another generation with the gospel? Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for my answer, I would like to just read scripture because scripture is better than anything that I could say. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to reread in the uh, message will read a portion of this. Um, so I'm going to do four and actually go through 13 instead of just 11. All right. So six, four, hero Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord, your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Mm -hmm. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. And then I'm going to jump down to 20 and go through, what did I say earlier? 20... 24. Four? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you, you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Mm -hmm. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. Amen. Um, so the question asked, in what specific ways does one generation entrust the gospel to the next generation? Mm -hmm. I think we just have to keep verbalizing and reminding them, um, you know, for this generation, the biggest thing in the Old Testament was the story of the, the Exodus yeah. for the children of Israel um, and the fact that God brought them out. And, and then many times throughout that um, trek that they took through the wilderness, they wanted to go back because it was easy for them. Um, and I think for us, we have to be reminded now that we're in the new covenant of the the price that Christ paid for us. Um, and when we tell it to our children, I, I read specifically 11 through 13 um, about remembering that we have all these things that we did not do um, because through Christ, we have atonement that we did not earn ourselves. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that is what we practically do is is remind our children and the generations after us, if you don't have children, um, you know, Christ did this for us mm -hmm. when we were undeserving. So, yeah. Amen. I ain't, I ain't got nothing to add to that. That's <laughs> the word of God. You just go to the next question. I'm okay. going to leave that alone. <laughs> and then the last question for today, in scripture, we are told again and again that even if we forget the covenant, God will never forget it. Mm -hmm. Why is that gospel reality such good news? How does that truth personally impact you? Um, you, you should know this. Um, <laughs> it, it's such a good reminder for me because, again, I'm so quick to forget. I'm so prone to wander. Mm -hmm. Like the song says, Lord, I feel it, but, oh, you're faithful. And it's even in Gen whether it's from Genesis all the way to Revelation, we see the promise start at the beginning in the garden and how God has kept it all the way to the end in Revelation. Yeah. And, and it's so good and it's such a great reminder for us to be able to trust in a God that, like you said with Abraham, that walked through 
the animals and took the covenant on his back that even when Abraham was unfaithful, God still kept his part of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Even when Israel was unfaithful, God was still faithful. Even when David, Abraham, like you can go, the list goes on and on and on. And it gets to us. And even when we're unfaithful, Mm -hmm. we can look back at the cross and say, well, God has been faithful. And Mm -hmm. I ain't going to preach on this because he already gave (laughs) a message on it. But it's, it's the great news of Christ's faithfulness. So when we get to the gospel and we see our sins ever before us, we can say, just like the man on the cross, I'm only in because of Christ. I'm only in because of the one on the middle cross that has died for my sin and mm-hmm. bore my shame. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's that great reminder above all reminders that we can ever remember yeah. is the gospel. Yeah. And I am mean, get too happy if I keep going on about this. <laughs> you want to say anything about that? No, I think that's it. Um, I think the gospel reality is such good news mm-hmm. because like for me, the biggest thing, um, if I'm ever like, feeling overcome by the world. I just think about that part in Revelation where it talks about the four creatures constantly encircling the throne and saying, holy, holy, holy. We serve a God that we are not going to know in this life Mm -hmm. near any facet of him. And the people that are the um, creatures that have been with him since the beginning of time still circle him and see a new facet of him. Um, And so just to think about the tiny piece that we play in this huge puzzle or picture or whatever is the correct analogy um Mm -hmm. just blows my mind and and it goes back again to the fact of our flesh wants to say that we are deity but in the reality of it we are dust and that's Mm -hmm. nothing more than just to humble us and see our true purpose is to serve a holy and magnificent god amen amen oh now we can go on for days but I thank y'all for joining us today. Today, um, as we were able to go over these questions with Mission Church Online, mm-hmm. um, we love you as a family, and we pray and hope that um, if you're in or near us uh, in our locations, whether it's in Memphis location or whether it's in Collierville, mm-hmm. that you would join us, that you would come worship alongside me and my wife or Stephen and his family. <laughs> um, we, we would love to have you here, um, and whether it's online or whether it's in person, we do hope that we will see you back here, that in God's grace, that he will continue to be with you, let his face shine upon you and give you his peace. We love you all, family, and we will see you again next week if it's in his mercy. Bye, guys.